everyone. I hope everyone is enjoying the first Big Rig User Conference. My name is Sam Schneider, and I'm going to be moderating a panel today about the secrets to scaling your customer success function. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation today, simply type your question into the Q&A widget available on the right-hand side of your screen. There's also a chat widget available to you if you want to chat with your fellow attendees, and I'm going to be monitoring both channels for questions. So let's get started. I'm the head of customer success for a company called Bloomfire. We're a leading knowledge engagement platform designed to connect teams with the information that they need to excel at their jobs. We're a small tech company based in Austin, Texas. However, we support large international companies and we're growing fast. Because of this, I know firsthand why it's incredibly important to scale your customer success team. And I've had to do so on a budget, being that I work for a small company. I have a lot of connections with other customer success leaders and due to the pandemic, you know, they've seen their head count or maybe their budgets reduced this year. So I think the conversation around scaling is really relevant for the time. On the panel today, we've invited three other customer success leaders from different industries and they're here to share their experience around how they've scaled their teams. So I thought we'd start out today, have everyone introduce themselves and give an overview of the companies they work for. So we're gonna start out with Antoinette Abood. Welcome, Antoinette. Thank you, Sam. Um, as Sam said, my name is Antoinette Abood and I'm the Director of Customer Success at Level Set, which is a mid-sized tech startup based out of New Orleans, Louisiana. And we are focused on creating a fair payment process in the construction industry. Uh, we work with small to enterprise level construction companies across the United States um, to help make sure that there's transparency and that they're all getting what they earn as quickly as possible. Um, and definitely happy to talk about scaling. We've been scaling our team year over year um, and it's been a really crazy ride and I'm excited to talk to everyone about that. Well, we're happy to have you here. Next, we have Matt Sellers. Hi, my name is Matt Sellers, and I'm the Director of Customer Success at CallRail, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. We provide marketing analytics and lead management software to help marketing and sales teams understand where their leads are coming from and communicate with them effectively. Uh, the company's been around since 2011, and we have seen pretty explosive year-over-year -year growth and I've been with the company since 2015, and so I'm excited to share some of my experience with, you know, coming in very early on in customer success and growing as the company quickly scales. We're really happy to have you here. And then finally, we have Lucy Law. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Lucy. I'm the Customer Success Operations Manager at Secure Code Warrior. We help developers level up their secure coding skills through an interactive online learning platform. We're based in Sydney, Australia, with offices in the US and EMEA. And like everyone here, we're scaling very quickly, and I'm excited to share everything that we've done today. Thank you, Lucy. So around the conversation of scaling a team, I believe there are three common elements that show up regardless of the size of the company, the industry that you're in, or even business function. And that's people, process, and technology. So I'm going to use that as a framework for our conversation today. So starting out with people, hiring the right people is an incredibly important component to scaling your team. So my first question to the group, and I'm gonna start out with Lucy this time is, how is your customer success team structured today? You know, what does your coverage model look like? Is your segmentation strategy, is that based on maybe, um, you know, the value of your customers, shared characteristics like personas, or maybe something as simple as product? Yeah, sure. So we have three customer success teams, one based in APAC, one based in EMEA, and one in the US. They all hold their clients based on where their program is run out of. We then segment in, on ARR, so our smallest clients are held by our customer six, success associates and their tech touch, so we do one-to-many approach with them. Our mid-market -mark is held by a customer success manager, and then our large are held by enterprise customer success managers and the SMEs. The larger clients are global and there's a lot of people that they're working with. But the same thing that happens with everyone is everyone is doing a strategic approach. It's just that the touch points vary. 
And a quick follow-up question, since you have a global team, do you favor certain platforms or channels for recruiting? Um, I'm not that part of the recruiting process, but I think LinkedIn learning and always, I'm sorry, LinkedIn and always using um, referral is a big one. I think when people know people, that's the best kind of indicator that they're going to do well and fit in well with the team. Thank you. How about you, Matt? How is your customer success team structured today? So we are structured in three tiers. Um, we have the tech touch tier, which kind of serves our SMB customer base, which is our largest group of customers. And then within the one-to-one -one success management, we have the mid-market group and then what we would call enterprise, which is really based on their spend with CallRail or the size of their actual company. So if it's a large enterprise or a growing startup that just raised a bunch of venture capital money, we're likely going to assign them to the enterprise team as well, just to give them that higher touch experience. And then for the, the folks that you bring on, um, are there different experience levels or maybe personality attributes that, that you look for when you're hiring folks into maybe the smaller segment of customers versus the enterprise customers? Yeah. So when we're looking to bring someone into the enterprise segment uh usually those are thankfully those have been done through internal promotions for the most part over the years but that is the one role if we're hiring externally we do look for a strong background in account management or customer success in SaaS specifically um, for the more mid-market or smb groups we get a little more creative with uh, hiring and we're often able to bring people who are looking to make a career change uh into those roles and so Really the biggest trait I look for in that uh, role is what I call kind of technical curiosity. And because we are a full SaaS product, we actually have our CSM candidates do a very lightweight demo of our product to us in the interview process, which that's been a really great tool. It eliminates a lot of you know biases you might have and it allows someone who maybe doesn't have SaaS experience or customer success experience, but is very tech savvy and hungry to get into the industry. It allows them to really shine versus someone who maybe has a lot of experience, but is more just, you know, checking the boxes on the career status and doesn't have that technical curiosity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How about you, Antoinette? How's your customer success team structured? Well, similarly to both Lucy and Matt, we have the SMB segment, mid-market segment and enterprise segment it is based off of that company's revenue, not what they're spending with us necessarily. Um, so that's one slight difference, but um, then we have teams that are dedicated to both. Um, and then the touch points are just different and the journey that we set up for them based off of the complexity that they would need. Right, um, for experience type or maybe personality attributes, is there something specific that you look for when hiring a customer success manager that really helps to scale a team? Definitely a really great question. And I think that we sort of started looking at that when we were scaling our SMB team, which is our biggest customer segment. And now we're starting to scale our mid-market team a little bit more. Um, and some of the attributes that we would look for are a little bit different depending on the segment. But um, active listening is always a really big one for us. Our customers have pain points. We need to make sure that we have someone who's not going to drive the agenda and instead actively respond to people. Um, someone who's resilient. Uh, you can be told no a lot or have objection handling calls where the customer wants to churn out. You need to be able to bounce back from that. And then also strong time management skills, because even as you're scaling, your CSMs are handling a lot of different things. It's renewal, it's retention, it's, um, you know, maybe the 20% of reactive things that are coming in that aren't handled by our support team members. So that time management is really important. Agreed. Moving on a process, you know, once you have the right people in place, you need to give them a framework or some type of a process or tools um, so they know what to do every day. Um, I believe the goal with process is just ensuring that your customers are able to um, continue to receive uh, achieve their desired outcomes. 
So some of the ways could be operationalizing repeatable processes through mapping out the customer journey, documenting workflows, creating playbooks, and then establishing um, you know, key performance indicators so you can monitor that progress. So my next main question to the panel is, what are some of the key processes that you've introduced in maybe the last one to two years that have really scaled your team? And I'd like to start out with Matt this time. Yeah, so over the past two years, we've definitely been on the journey of shifting from one, being very reactive to two, being very more proactive and kind of how we've gone through that process. We really had to make a shift from using customer success as kind of the catch-all role as it was when I started, you know, if we need someone to upgrade an account or implement a white label, like that would always come to us. And, you know, in order to grow the team and help them work efficiently, what we did was really focused on what impact can we have on these accounts and how can we give them the appropriate experience versus you know, trying to shove them through all of our varying processes that we thought they needed. So does an SMB account really need four QBRs a, year, QBRs a year, things like that, that we were kind of trying to apply industry standard things to the team. Uh, we quickly shifted to focusing on where can the CSM provide value to these accounts and what is the experience at every level that that account desires? Do they just need quicker access to support or a better channel there, or do they need an actual higher touch experience from us? Um, that was the key to helping us scale was, you know, not just assigning a CSM based on a revenue number, but assigning a CSM based on the impact they can have with that account. Right. How about you, Antoinette? Key processes introduced. Yeah. So um, we started doing journey mapping a little while ago and a lot of it in the last one to two years has been iterating on that and making some updates to that process and adding in some other plays that really kind of take that playbook that you're talking about and put that into a scalable system so it's being pushed out instead of people having to search for it um, and some of that was evaluating like are these touch points really necessary at this time because we did increase the portfolio uh, size for our SMB team. So how can we um, kind of optimize when we're reaching out to customers and when they need to hear from us? Um, and then we also did a lot of work to create a really strong renewal process and then take some reactive things and make them less time consuming, like failed payments. When a customer has one, how are we responding to that? How can we automate some of that and take, put a little bit of lift behind it instead of putting it all on a human's plate? Right. What are some of the key performance indicators that you look at to ensure that the process that you implemented is successful or training in the right direction? Definitely. Um, for something like the renewals, a lot of that was the renewal rate. Um, and like, are we seeing that consistently improve or at least stay steady over time. Um, we have a sentiment that we put in with renewals so we can have probability. It's almost like a renewal pipeline that our team can review. So we're constantly looking at that and iterating on that and saying, okay, who did we think was going to renew that actually renewed? What, what could we have done differently in that? So that's renewal rate for that. Um, in terms of failed payment, which is another process I mentioned that we did recently, we are monitoring for how many saves we can get. How many of those people actually end up leaving and how many can we get payment in and keep in the door and actually re-engage them and use that as an opportunity. Um, and then for our journeys, a lot of that's retention. Right. Lastly, Lucy, what are some key processes introduced? I guess as a scale up, and I think everyone is kind of doing the same thing, we're moving from re being reactive to being strategic. One of the big things that we're working on the moment is our internal processes. So not even things the customer will see, but how we do work with our customer and how we can treat them. So one of the things that we're working on at the moment is identifying that risk as soon as possible. Obviously today, a lot more clients are at risk due to varying factors. So what we've done is create multiple churn scores based on client sentiment, product usage, use of sticky features, and that lets us kind of identify risk as early as possible. So we, as we have a global team, 
That means everyone is looking at risk in the same way and we have a process in which that risk is mitigated. So once we have that risk identified, we have a custom table which you can log so everyone has view and can view it. Off each risk, we have an automated journey. So it kind of also takes out that guesswork for CSMs. So everyone is treating every risk type in the same way. Even though our clients are spread across the world, they're all very similar. And it really allows us to kind of knowledge share and kind of approach our customers in the best way. Definitely. When looking at some of the processes that you've implemented, because we've all had to introduce new ways that we track health scores, which is the pandemic going on. We have to look at industries. We have to look at usage. Um, and some of the data can be a little murky. Um, have you ever had to recently do like a course correction on, on, on maybe like a process you put in place that you started seeing maybe a couple of months later, like the trends weren't going in the, the right direction? Yeah, that's I think, go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. I think for, for us or for me, at least this course correction happens all the time. I think when we go in to say a new process is coming out, we go in with the expectation that it will change. We come out with version one and we know there's going to be a version two. And something that we're always looking at is feedback from the field. So we ask the CSMs, what's happening? Is it working? And how can we make it better? And one of the things that we do is ask those CSMs to input those processes themselves so we can improve it. And I think that's one of the things that's really helping us work well. Same question to you, Matt. Um, have you ever introduced a new process and then based on the trends had to do a, a pretty severe course correction or introduce a new process on top of that? Yeah, so to kind of go back to my previous statement or my previous discussion, I'd say the quarterly business review was definitely a big learning curve for us. We you know, thought that that was gonna be the way to move to being fully proactive was give everybody a QBR and it'll be great. And what we quickly learned is that wasn't the right experience for every customer. And so we quickly shifted in what we were measuring because we were going to use that as the measurement. Like, did you do a QBR or not? Um, we shifted to, you know, giving the CSM flexibility to interact with customers the way they prefer to. So some of them do want a quarterly meeting. Some of them want a monthly status meeting. Some of them just want to talk via email. So not focusing so much on the exact type of activity, but more focusing on, are we communicating with these customers and bringing them items of value and then not caring so much about the medium um, that allowed us to see a lot more positive responses from our customers and actually seeing good engagement with them by actually meeting them where they wanted to be met. Yeah, definitely. So once processes are in place, um, the next thing we would talk about or the third kind of leg of the stool is technology. Because in my opinion, um, you can't scale a team without investing in technology. You know, leveraging tools just improves efficiencies and ensures that you're offering both an excellent and sustainable experience to support sometimes even more customers. So with all of your investment in technology, and spoiler alert, I know we're all using turn zero here, um, what were some of the biggest drivers for productivity gains that you may have saw, you know, recently, or maybe changes in staffing needs where, you know, you may ha not have had to change like the level of your staff, but you were able to support more customers um, in the future. And why don't we start out with you, Antoinette? Definitely. Um, I mentioned, I think the last time I talked that we have actually changed the portfolio size of our team. And that is something that technology has been able to allow us to do because we can provide lift and automation through the tech that we use. So we can now supplement in a very smart way, the touch points that don't need to be human. And we can push a little bit more of that into the product. Um, another really great thing that we've been able to do with Lucy. Oh, yep. sorry. No, 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 sorry, sorry, go ahead. Oh. Um, is just use data-driven insights and push that through technology and enable our team to have different ways of connecting with customers. Sorry, I didn't mean to um, cut in. It was a Zoom freeze, which we're all used to. <laughs> um, I was gonna, my follow-up question to that is, um, 
with your investment in technology, and this is a common thing that I hear from customer success leaders, were you able to change the way as well that you monitor or measure your customer health? 100%. Um, using technology to do that completely changed my life personally, uh, because I was the one that was calculating our health scores and I was pulling data from seven different places and we didn't have real time actionable information. And now that we're using technology, we can act real time. A red flag appears, we can trace it back to something that happened a month earlier and we know a month earlier now, like we're not waiting and being so reactive. Um, his being a customer success manager, as we all know, it's all about that proactivity, but we can only be as proactive as a lot of the data that we're getting and that we're acting on. Um, so that's been a huge game changer for us. Absolutely. Lucy, same, uh, similar question that I asked Antoinette. Um, what were some of the biggest drivers for, you know, productivity gains? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. With as a SaaS company, I think that we're lucky to have a lot of great SaaS companies that we work with as well. Um, and across our business, we've seen so many gains, not just because our customer success team is using Trend Zero, but because every team in the company is using Trend Zero. So we have just driven so much more visibility into our customers. Um, because we got Trend Zero really early in our journey of scaling. Um, it became it came on a lot earlier than a lot of our CSMs itself. So we've been able to use that to drive how we grow, as well as driving the other teams. And I think that's really underpinned our growth and really helped us there. Um, bringing people on and everyone having that same journey and everyone has already come with that mindset that this is what we use and this is how we use it and this is the data it's providing and that's how we scale is, is really helping us. And with purchasing technology, I know leadership sometimes will get licenses or they want to pull reports out. What are some of the, the favorite features of the platform um, that your leadership team monitors on a regular basis? Do they like the NPS reporting, survey responses? Do you have any examples? Yeah. yeah, so I think one of the great things we've done is plugged in the platform, our platform usage into Trend Zero as well. So I think a lot of people are using that. So that is one of the factors of our health score, how people are using the platform and what features. That's also something product is using and they can see where there's downfall. And that is also what the leadership team is using um, as well. We're always looking at the MPS scores and seeing how we can improve them and their response rates. And hopefully CSAT will come out soon and we'll be able to use that in a different way as well. Thank you. Matt, what were some of the drivers in your productivity gains? Yeah, so prior to bringing on Churn Zero, you know, we did not have a dedicated platform of any means for our team. So we were working across the call rail application, out of our inbox, in Salesforce, in Zendesk. So we didn't have a centralized platform for anything. And as we were trying to get to that position where we could bring valuable insights to our customers, it just wasn't possible without you know, clicking around an account or doing a development request. So from really day one of implementing Churn Zero without any automation in place, we now had a central place to see Salesforce, Zendesk, email, call rail product info. So that alone added so much, you cut down on the time a CSM needed to navigate an account and look up a ticket or find product usage. It was now all in that one central place. So that did allow us to increase the amount of accounts a CSM could handle just because there was less, you know, manual work involved in just the overall management of the account. Um, and then at the same time, they were able to bring, even without any automation, again, they were able to bring much more valuable insights to their customers just based on the data that was showing up, looking at an account insurance zero versus looking in five different places prior to that. Um, and I know investment in technology can be pretty expensive. You know, if you don't have a large budget, this could be your budget for the year. If this is like your one investment. So um, how did you approach your leadership team um, with purchasing some um, maybe expensive technology? Were there, were there ways that you kind of got them to buy into it? Yeah, so this it's pretty you, interesting. Matt. We, yeah. 
very early on, we approached leadership about getting some sort of customer success tool. And we were in the phase of the company at the time where we knew we had great engineers. So we just built internal things ourselves. So that was actually how we started was we built an internal customer success dashboard and it ended up not being that great. The leadership team kind of admitted it wasn't what we needed. So we had that playing our advantage from very early on. And so that allowed us to get sure zero, you know, bought in. And then, you know, I liked what you all were talking about earlier with other teams getting interested in churn zero and wanting to pull data from it, you know, very quickly, I, when we were in the early days of churn zero, I showed it off to other teams and I had marketing and product asking to get access and asking to pull data. So I think that was, And this transitions well into customer success operations. So I know this is an emerging role in the field of customer success. Lucy, I know Secure Code Warrior specifically hired you for this role two years ago. So for folks on the webinar today that aren't familiar with customer success operations, could you give us an overview of your responsibilities, how you work with a team, and some of the benefits that you provide? Yeah, so I'm part of the operations team at Secure Code Warrior. Um, I really partner with the customer success team specifically to help scale and build those repeatable processes. I do help them and look into automations that we can make their days easier. And there's a lot of cross collaboration with customer success, I'm uh, sorry, with sales operations, with product marketing and with marketing itself. So I think that's kind of bringing in and looking at what the customer success managers want to do, but they don't have time and just kind of facilitating that. Uh, that's something that I'm, I'm really passionate about. And I was going to say, Antoinette, you recently hired in the last year, someone in the role of customer success operations. What are some of the signs that you were seeing at the time that you were like, I really need someone to fill this role for the team? Definitely a great question. Um, so we were looking around and we have a pretty large customer success org right now, and we use a lot of different technology. Some of it we share with the sales team, and it was really hard to manage all of the different processes in those different places to make sure that we were getting clean data that we would make churn zero as actionable and real time and allow us to be as proactive as possible. So it's um, it was a combination of just too many people managing too many different processes. Um, and then also knowing that the direction that our company was going in with a lot of like data driven insights, helping us reach out to customers at different times instead of doing like a more static journey. We reach out at month two, month three, whatever. Um, we also knew that we needed someone who could manage that and provide that lift to our CSMs um, as well as to uh, the other parts of our organization. Um, so part of it's clean data and using technology to the best of its ability. Um, and standardizing a lot of process that was previously managed by different managers. I can't agree with you more. It's so important to have clean data. <laughs> you get out what you put in. So exactly. my last question for everyone is, you know, for the folks dialing into the webinar today, you know, let's say someone wants to scale their team. What's a great pro tip or recommendation that you could leave with them? And why don't we start out with you, Lucy? Sure. Um, so my number one tip is always get the CSMs and the CS leads involved in the process changes. Um, that kind of means that they're bought into that change and they own it and you have champions on the ground. It makes it so much easier when people have put in their input and they are passionate about this change and they want to lead it. I think that's one of the great things that we've done at Secure Code Warrior. Thank you. Great recommendation. How about you, Matt? What's a pro tip? Yeah, I would say get your leadership team involved in talking to customers. Um, historically, I would say that would mean in-person FaceTime, but it's probably more virtual now. But everything from hearing a customer's product request to hearing their feedback on pricing um, and everything in between, that's helped immensely. And when it comes time to add headcount or when it times, 
comes time to work on a tough renewal, like having leadership, you know, having them seeing the customer and hearing from them the value the product brings and where their challenges are, that's been instrumental in growing the team and continuing to have their support along the way. Thank you. And Antoinette. So both great pieces of advice. I'll try to make mine a little bit different. Um, I would say take a little bit of time to plan out how you see your organization growing with your existing customer base and really think about the types of positions that you might need next at the end of next year. So think about 2021. What does your team look like? Start making a quarterly plan for your growth. But most importantly, don't be afraid to pivot. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned, um, you know, moving into even just a managerial role over the CFMs and then to all of CS was just, you're going to have to iterate a lot and it's okay if something that you decide to do doesn't pan out, just pivot quickly. And that's why those key performance indicators and real-time data and information are so important. So you can pivot intelligently and work smart, not long. Completely agree. So that brings us to the end of the panel session. Um, you know, I think this has been a great conversation. We've had some, you know, great recommendations and actionable insights. Um, I want to thank everyone on the panel for their time um, and the success, story, success stories and expertise that they've shared today. Lucy, I know you're not going to be able to attend the Q&A session. I know you got to leave us. You only have 30 minutes today. Um, so thank you again for your time before we move on to the Q&A session. So the first question I have for you is from Naomi. Uh, what are the signs that you need to hire another customer success manager? Uh, do you subscribe to monitoring specific metrics for staffing needs? It's a really great question and one that we've reevaluated recently. Um, I know I mentioned that we changed the kind of portfolio size for our customers. And so we, um, for our customer success managers, we have um, kind of triggers that we're looking at. The portfolio size that an average SMB CSM would own is about 1.2 million in revenue. And when they start to get close to that or maybe surpass it a little bit, and then, you know, we also notice that maybe their proactive activities or in KPIs, they're starting to drop a little. Um, there's kind of all of these different metrics that we're looking at across the board uh, to see if we, one, need to either change a process or hire someone new. So similar question to you. Um, you know, I know the topic was around scaling. So what are the signs that um, in your organization that you would uh, look at to see that you need to hire another customer success ma manager? Um, is it based on metrics? Is it based on, you know, just meeting with their team members to make sure that they're not underwater? Yeah. So when we're, or as we're, you know, continuing to grow the team, we always try and leave a little bit of bandwidth, especially with the newer team members. So we can continue to take on accounts really quickly. We have a pretty fast sales cycle and bring in a lot of new customers each month. So we're always kind of prepared for those accounts. And then uh, because we are a usage-based platform, our clients come in and grow over time. And so they might not start with our group and they might work their way up. So we've kind of built headcount modeling around what can a CSM handle based on the interactions we know we have with our existing customers. And so then we can kind of apply that to what we know is coming in the revenue pipeline and then the growth we're seeing within our customer base as well. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what technology do you both use besides churn zero? Yeah, we use, so obviously churn zero and then we have Salesforce for our CRM um, and then Zendesk for our ticketing platform and as I kind of alluded to earlier, that's one of the huge things I like about Turn Zero is having it all integrated in one place for the team. All right, next question. Uh, which departments do you give access to your uh, client success platform? So we were talking earlier about the, the leadership reports. Uh, besides leadership, do you have other departments that maybe utilize a license? We do not. Um, just the CSMs are utilizing licenses right now, but a lot of that information feeds back into Salesforce. So everyone has access to the CSMs notes, 
we have access to sales notes from Salesforce, so it kind of feeds back in. All right. What are some tips for convincing your upper management that you need to scale up? Um, so I saw a couple comments in the chat channel. Um, you know, others like me, they work for a very small organization. They have a limited budget. So did you use any specific um, methods or tactics for selling technology to your upper management? So I feel really lucky we didn't, it wasn't a hard sell. They invested really early on in customer success and were a big fan when we said we wanted to try tech, but um, we decided to hold back because our data wasn't clean enough. And we wanted to make sure that whenever we signed up that we were ready because you know, the mantra, bad data in, bad data out. And uh, we didn't want to sign up for something and then churn from it because we weren't prepared. Right. All right. Anyone have thoughts on hiring for a growing team? So I think that question is around, um, do you look for specific personality types that work better on a team that's going to be quickly expanding, quickly changing processes? You may be throwing different technology at them. Yeah, I found for, and this has happened year over year at CallRail as we kind of go through constant change. Um, a lot of times getting people into like a mid-market CSM role who are a little bit younger in their career and kind of, as I mentioned earlier, that come from a variety of backgrounds, uh, that's really good in finding people that, you know, kind of thrive in almost the ambiguity and the constant change. Um, so yeah, we've had pretty good success with bringing in people who are probably a little bit younger in their career with maybe not five years of customer success experience, but they've, you know, proven through the interview process that they can you know, they're fit for the job and they're, you know, they want to work for a fast growing tech company. So they're kind of willing to roll with all the changes. And then I think this question is geared more towards Antoinette. Are there ARR expectations um, for your different customer success managers that manage different segments, um, specifically small to medium sized businesses versus enterprise? Definitely a difference there. Um, so even with mid-market, there's a slightly higher ARR like portfolio for the mid-market account managers, and then it goes up again for our enterprise or strategic accounts um, because those are just going to be much bigger deals. Um, but it's still, we don't want it to be too, too different. I mean, if a mid-market person is owning over 1.5, 1.7, it can get difficult because one of their customers is like 10 to potentially 20 SMB customers in terms of the number of contacts you have there. Um, and I noticed there was a question about like hiring for having different types of conversations. The mid-market team, they're speaking to the C-suite, um, to regional managers, to end users. So we, it's kind of like having a lot of customers in one. So um, yes, there are differences, but it's not as different as you would probably imagine. And then last question, um, what, what role does automation play in scaling your team? Uh, obviously I know it, it plays a big role at all three of our organizations, um, but we have about 30 seconds left. I think one of you should take this question. Yeah, I would say, don't automate everything, but really look at what are the things that can, you know, allow your CSMs to leverage better conversations. So can you tee up an email for the CSM to review, or can you do things to, you know, get QBR set up, just really anything to free up the CSMs time. I would start with that and, you know, scale up from there. Thank you so much. So I really want to appreciate, um, you know, the the folks on the panel today, Ant uh, Antoinette and Matt, um, and I hope everyone enjoys Big Rig.